So, ladies and gentlemen, the next part of our program is an interview by CMI founder and founder also of Investor Intel, Tracy Wislowski, who will be speaking with Constantine Karanopoulos, President, CEO, Director of New Performance Materials, Inc. And uh, I understand there, there may be a couple little surprises for you. So, Tracy, Constantine. Well, some of us have been around uh, for a while, and it's great to see old friends um, in this environment where it's you know fashionable to be talking rare earths and critical materials and minerals. Um, now, how we all make money, it's a different story, but we're, we're in the news frequently. So, yeah, it's a good time to be chatting about this. Speaking of being in the news, he's kind of pushing my face, and he's like, Reuters is, wants to do an interview with me tomorrow. Why does Reuters want to do an interview with you? Well, about Could it be the breaking news you just put out two hours ago? Uh, most likely. Um, well, we, for those who perhaps um, are, are not aware of it, um, we, we announced this morning that uh, the government of Estonia and the, government, the uh, European Union uh, awarded us uh, up to, and I'm trying to be very careful here, uh, up to 18.75 million euros um, to go towards uh, our capex of a new magnet facility in Estonia, which will be next door, very close to our existing rare earth processing facility in Estonia. Um, and we're very thankful about it. So I think this will be um, a very meaningful addition to the Western world's uh, magnet capacity. So if you don't mind kind of explaining to some people who are new to the industry what this actually means about your position in the supply chain in the rare earth, you know, in the rare earth supply chain. Sure. The, uh, Neil, <coughs> excuse me, we've been around for 30 years. We started with two rare earth separation facilities in China. Fast forward, we have a third rare earth separation facility in Estonia. <clears throat> so we are part of the rare earth industry and the rare earth supply chain. But in addition, um, our MagnaQuench division takes those rare earths, <clears throat> converts them into metals, alloys, magnetic powders, and magnets in uh, two, uh, well, in a, mag in a magnetic materials facility in China, another one in Thailand, and two magnet plants, uh, one in Tianjin and one in Chuzhou in, um, in Anhui province in China. So this is our first foray into making magnets outside of China, where we do, these, these are different magnets, mind you, but it, we already do about 90% of what a flow sheet looks like for a magnet facility, so we'll transplant that to Estonia. And um, we're doing that because that's where we're under tremendous pressure by our customers in the European EV supply chains to, to be making these magnets by 2025. So what it does is it stretches our presence in the supply chain uh, a little further downstream. And together with uh, an investment that we're a very modest investment we made in Greenland on a a rare earth deposit. Eventually, in the fullness of time, perhaps Neil will be a fully integrated magnet producer all the way back to the mine. So not to be too cute about it, but the narrative is all about mine to magnets. <clears throat> Again, 10 years later, Jack, if you remember the original mine to magnets narrative from 2010, <clears throat> I, I prefer to use magnets to mine. I mean, it, whatever we do is driven by our expansion into magnets and the demand that that creates, and we need to backfill that with, uh, with mining. But we currently have separate, rare earth separation, metal making, and all the way to magnet production. So it, it makes us still a bit more unique, if you want, than, uh, than what we were up to recently. Okay, so you, ta you touched on Greenland, and of course, Jeff Bezos, a number of large billionaires, all of a sudden are interested in critical minerals in Greenland, and then you announced it. 
you know, tell me why Greenland today? Gee, I never thought it would be mentioned in the same sentence. Well, no, I'm going to mention this because, you know, five years ago, you know, everyone was telling me you can't develop anything in Greenland. The, they won't allow you to. The environmentalist will not allow you to. And now it sounds like everybody's looking at Greenland. What's changed? Well, I don't think that's an accurate uh, description of what goes on in Greenland. I mean, they have a very uh, responsible government that has made very clear rules, and at least in terms of resource extraction, they will not allow any oil and gas uh, extraction, and they will not allow any uranium extraction. And the definition of uranium extraction is any deposit of any metal that contains more than 100 parts per million of uranium in the ground, they will not approve. Well, this deposit, and there's a couple folks in this room that are very familiar with this deposit, is less than 10 parts per million uranium, so there's no issues. You know, like every other jurisdiction, you really need to understand um, what the lay of the land is to, and to make sure that you do all the right things locally. I mean, if you walk into a new geography and expect to do business just like you do in downtown Toronto, that doesn't exist. So you need to, to take the time and spend the money and talk to the right people and eventually things work out. I mean, we did this in China for 30 years, right? So we're kind of used to challenging uh, geographies. One of the themes we've been going over is the attraction of capital that is happening in the sector right now. Would you say that's correct? We kind of put energy fuels on the, uh, you know, we asked them, what are you going to do with all the money that you have right now? Um, and I know <laughs> you have a very tight relationship with, with energy fuels. What are you going to do? I mean, you just raised another 65 million? Canadian, yep. Canadian, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we have, you know, and uh, I guess I, I don't want to... Um, preempt our earnings release Friday morning. Uh, but yeah, we're sitting on round numbers, $100 million US, and we, all of it is earmarked for growth projects. Um, I, I think in this industry, you really need to keep growing simply because, not because of you know, ideological or uh, sort of uh, other considerations, but you gotta grow because the demand is exploding for, especially for, for magnets. I mean, this decarbonization transition is one of those forces that um, come across our lives once in a lifetime. And I think there will be huge fortunes created uh, because of it, decarbonization, energy transition, electrification. And um, in order, in, in, you know, beyond our own greed, we all want to make fortunes, but at the same time, um, decarbonizing and becoming more energy efficient is good for the planet. In fact, it's imper the imperative is really urgent to do that. Um, and you can't decarbonize without rare earths. I mean, you can, but you, you won't be very efficient and very good at it. So, you know, rare earths are back in sort of the category of becoming almost indispensable, just like they were 15 years ago, until 2011 drove very smart people with very deep pockets to design rares out of their systems and created a three to four year gap in, in development. So we're back in the forefront, and, and this time it's a lot more, um, the, the, the debate and the narrative is, has become a lot more intense because you have geopolitics superimposed on top of the industry in a way that is almost as, perhaps it's a, it's a little greater, it's a little bigger than what it was in 2011 when the, the Japanese uh, Coast Guard uh, you know, messed around with a Chinese fishing boat near the Senkaku Islands and then the Chinese cut off uh, the Japanese from rare earths for seven weeks, that's all it lasted. So, but today, the, the geopolitical environment is um, much more, I guess, serious than it was in 2011. You know, we're in the middle of a war in Ukraine. Um, we have an energy crisis. And I think the, the, world, the world's balance is being remade. And 
part of that equation, I think, is uh, unavoidably uh, rarest. So, uh, you, in, in discussing the Ukrainian invasion, how is that impacting you and your shareholders? I mean, Estonia, I, I have received more than a few emails about what's happening with Neo Performance and how you're managing those political issues. Well, from a share price perspective, it has been a disaster because investors have run for the exits the moment uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, run for the exits in our name because we have a plant very close to Russia. It's in Estonia. In fact, when you, when you, you can walk to, along the beach uh, and you, to the Narva River, which is the northern border between Russia and Estonia, the Estonian border, and you can see the, uh, the Russian uh, guard stations on the other side of the river. And they still wear these big hats. And they still have AK-47s. And they're still there. In fact, the, when Estonia built a bridge over the Narva River to connect Narva, the city in Estonia, to the Russian side of the town, the Russians uh, objected to the bridge. And they made sure that the bridge cannot sustain large tanks going over it which is now not a bad thing to, to have as they, they invade other geographies. So the moment that happened, um, it, it, it was a disaster for our stock. We've lost you know, 50, 60, 70% of our uh, market cap because of it. And to me, it, it really doesn't make sense because it's business as usual. We've given up maybe a couple of customers in Russia, uh, but we still continue to receive you know, a good portion of our raw materials uh, from, from Russia, uh, the balance, of course, being energy fuels, thankfully, which is getting bigger quickly. Um, so it, it, I, I was at a seminar with uh, Prem Watsa recently, and he said when he was a, a young guy sort of learning, his, learning the ropes in the financial industry, he had a mentor who told him that when the cannon starts, that's when you buy, uh, and then you sell when, before the peace dividend. You know, in our case, it was the exact opposite. When the cannon fire started, everybody was selling. I've been buying myself. Uh, as soon as I'm out of, you know, whenever I'm out of blackout, I, I, I have been buying uh, Neo stock, so I'll continue to do that, because the fundamentals, you know, everybody knows what the fundamentals are, and, and the specifics, I have enough confidence in our ability to execute a growth strategy that, you know, I, I, I think I have a lot of faith in, in the company and the show. So let's just jump to this one. Jack was talking earlier. Uh, you know, obviously Jack is one of my most esteemed colleagues in the industry. And he says that the EV, EV demand that is currently out there is not realistic with the scarcity of many of the critical minerals listed in the battery materials, for instance. Well, do you have any thoughts on that that you would like to add? Do you agree with Jack? Absolutely. I, that, that's about as, I mean, if there is one truism about critical materials, that's it. I, today, we're not extracting and processing enough to, sus, to achieve the targets that governments and OEMs have set around the world, which means that over the next year, we will need to increase by orders, plural, of magnitude, and the investment, I mean, I was, I was reading a, an article in the South China Morning Post. One of the big banks came up with a $50 trillion capital investment necessary for China alone to achieve its decarbonization, electrification, clean energy targets, and so on. That's a mind-boggling amount. And if that's only for China, again, I'm, I may be off by a factor of 10 or something, but even... You know, the, the level of investment that the world needs is in the trillions. It's not in the billions. So there's a massive task ahead of, ahead of us. And I don't think governments around the world really appreciate how complex this, the solution to the decarbonization problem is. You will need an extraordinary level of investment. You will need an extraordinary, extraordinary level of capacity expansion for all the critical minerals. And, you know, I'm, listen, I, I consider myself an environmentalist, but, 
you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want to decarbonize, and if you want a clean energy transition, we need more mining, we need more factories that will take whatever comes out of the mine and make it into the products that will allow us to decarbonize. Maybe there's a magic way to, to do it that I, I don't know about, but the, the level of investment and the level of activity, of capacity increase for all of these materials is immense, and I don't think we're ready for it, not yet. And, and what about the talent? What about the professionals? Where are we supposed to get these, Constantine? Well, it reminds me of a, I think the first time we met was at a conference in DC. And I spoke at that conference and I said that it has taken two decades for the supply chains to migrate from North America to Asia. It'll take at least as long for them to come back. And it starts with education. Um, I also remember another presentation I gave where I, where I said that China graduates more engineers than in North America were graduating graduates. So we're not graduating enough science, technology, engineering, mathematics grads, and this world that we are trying to get to we'll need an awful lot of skills. And they start at the university that were way behind the, the eight ball and will, con and will continue through, uh, through the, industrial, um, the industrial world. So no, right now, there are not enough skills uh, to do it. Now, what we're doing is we're training our people in Estonia uh, from our tech center in Singapore. There's exchanges with our plants in China. Um, so the, the technology transfer has started to go the other way. For the last 30 years, it's been from the West into China. It's now coming the other way. One last example, and I'll shut up, Tracy. Today, if you look at all, you know, the, the only meaningful magnet manufacturing jurisdiction outside of China is Japan. Look at what the, the latest expansion of the Japanese manufacturer of magnets was into Vietnam. Shinetsu high-end, high-quality, high price, the whole Japanese shebang. Every single piece of equipment that went into Vietnam by Shinetsu was bought in China. The metal furnaces, the uh, alloy furnaces, the, the strip gas furnaces, the sintering furnaces, the slicing and dicing setups, the coating facilities, they were all made in China because no one makes these types of engineered systems in Japan or anywhere else in the world. So, and, and in our plant in Estonia, well, guess what? The critical pieces of equipment are all coming from China, which is absolutely kosher, by the way. Don't, don't freak out. On I promised Constantine we would keep a strict structure, and he has to run, but we're not going to let him loose yet until I put you on the spot. We know you own a lot of your own shares. We know you must own some shares of energy fuels because you have a deal with them. What other critical mineral company are you currently following? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, I, I... You can speak in vagaries if you like. A tech company, cathode and known technology application. Uh, well, I, I, I was big in lithium, and I'm not big anymore. Um, I, I was invested in lithium because of virtue, by virtue, the company I was chairman of. <clears throat> Constantine is chairman of Neo Lithium. Yeah, um, and timing being what it is, it, it I guess worked out for our shareholders really well. Um, the you know, there's a few companies around the world that I follow because I like the project. You know, I, I learned about rare earths in China, so I, I, and Alistair Neal in the back was part of that experience when the heavy rare earth industry was completely revolutionized by ionic clays in the south. So we, we spent a lot of work trying to train folks at the Department of Chemical Engineering and University of Toronto how to recognize ionic character and how to evaluate it. So there's, there's a bunch of projects right now that are being developed. I like the Hogchild project in Chile, the Aclara project. 
I've lost my shirt on that, but it'll come back. It's a good project, but you know, the environmental, uh, there's a new government in Chile, as you may know, and it's not very friendly towards resource extraction, but I'm told things are changing again in Chile. I like that project because of its characteristics. I like Serra Verde in Brazil. It's run by a friend who's also on my board, um, Eric Norez, and it will be in production uh, reasonably soon. I like uh, Ionic Veris in Africa, but it's a challenge jurisdiction. So, you, you know, what are you going to do? I like um, uh, AR3 Dudley Kings North Company, which I visited recently in, uh, in uh, Adelaide. Of course, another selling point of that project is that it's in the Kunawara district, so you can get a decent bottle of wine when you visit the, you know, at lunch when you visit the, uh, the deposit. Um, I, I like things that can, I, I like exploration um, companies that are dealing with deposits that have a chance to be competitive against China. Not at today's prices or last year's prices, but even at prices during the dog days of the industry. So. You know, Mali, again, uh, perhaps I'm too jaundiced by my Molycorp experience, but Molycorp filed for bankruptcy when uh, neodymium hit 35 bucks. So you need to be able to survive at prices that the Chinese can survive, because guess what? You may have to live in that sort of a world. So these prices, uh, I, I like ionic, uh, as I said, I like ionic materials and I like projects that have a very simple mineralogy that allow you to produce a mineral concentrate and a mixture of carbonate very, very competitively. I mean, I, you know, we invested in one in Greenland for that, that exact reason. Um, and I also like things that are very high in the magnetic uh, rare earths in the distribution. Um, Hastings is a, in that respect ticks that box. Uh, very high in DPR ratios. 40% or more. Um, so these are the things that, that I'm looking for. And you know, there's a few, there's a few around. Like I, I didn't want to say anything for a lot of the projects in this room, but we're probably talking to most of the people in the room about, and, and what I say usually is, if you get to the point where you have a product that we can buy, we'd love to buy it. It's sort of, uh, like that, that line in the movie, you know, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, we'll come, absolutely. We're a net buyer of NDPR, we're a net buyer of cerium and lanthanum. Raise your hand if you know anybody else who buys cerium and lanthanum these days. Uh, and we're a net buyer of, um, we're a big buyer of um, mixed rare earth carbon. So we'll continue to be a net buyer regardless of what else we do. So if your project looks like it'll get there, we'll, we'll buy from you, no question about it. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've run a little bit over, but I think you can, you've got six minutes, yeah. right, to run? Thank you.